So in this video, what I want to do is talk about chemistry. What is the plan for chapter 15? What should you be studying for your test? Um, and how can you be ready for the concepts in thermal chemistry? Now, when, I, when people hear the word test, sometimes they might panic. Oh, no, there's a test. Okay, here's the deal. What we're saying is there's a concept, thermal chemistry and thermodynamics. It has some key terms for us to know, like what is the first law of thermodynamics? What is the second law of thermodynamics? What is entropy? What is enthalpy? Like, <clears throat> we know the specific things we need to know. So what we need to do then is make a good series of notes by reading through the chapter, taking notes, focusing on the concepts in the chemistry syllabus document. If you need me to send that to you again, I can do that. But the idea is, let's go back. Have we written the definitions for chapter 15? Have we written all the formulas in chapter 15? Have we written the examples 15.1, 15.2, 15.7, and 15.8 as good guides for us as we go into chapter 15 more? In chapter example 15.1, they ask the question, how much energy will be required to melt 3.54 grams of ice at zero degrees Celsius to water without any temperature change? We know the mass is 3.54 kilograms. Um, we know the, uh, the delta H is 6.01 kilojoules per mole. We go ahead and we convert the mass of water to the energy required, and that goes pretty smoothly. We take the mass that we've been given and we convert it to grams, and then we use the molar mass of water, which is 18.02 uh, grams per mole. So again, example 15.1, we write down the mass that we've been given, all right, 3.54 kilograms. We write down the, um, the, the, the delta H that was given. Let's see, actually, no, that's given, no, that's knowledge that we have. That's the, the, the uh, uh, fusion. We find that using charts and tables, and those are available to us. And that can be given to us, um, in this case, it's 6.01 kilojoules per mole. So you just go to your table for the enthalpies of fusion and vaporization, and you can use that uh, value that has been given to you. So again, kilojoules per mole. So that's given to you in the chart on page uh, 359. So we write down the example and we literally work it out based on what they show us in the example. I'll come back and discuss these with you on Thursday, but right now your goal is just take chapter 15 and do those things. Then go to uh, the, 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 the resource of either Khan Academy or a different video. Maybe there's someone else you watch for understanding your video concepts. Use that person's videos to then answer the question, what is a calorimeter? Can you explain that to somebody else? What is an endothermic reaction? What is an exothermic reaction, right? It, you have certain reactions where they, they need heat. Heat comes in for that reaction to happen. There's certain reactions that give off heat, right? So endothermic and exothermic. And which one has a positive delta H and which one has a negative delta H? These are things that you'll learn in chapter 15. Again, what is the first law of thermodynamics? What is Gibbs free energy formula, right? This is something that will be helpful as you go through chapter 15 as well. So what are we doing for chapter 15 in chemistry? We're going through the document I've given you and we're going to use those concepts as our focus, like a foci, a focus for the test that we'll take uh, next week on chapter 15. So we'll try and have that quiz actually on Monday just because we'll spend more time going over some of these concepts. We're going to keep our focus to just these concepts, but please read the whole chapter. I know you won't understand every single thing the first time, but just give it a try. Just read through, see the, each section, read the application section of chapter 15. That is something that I can always pull uh, problems from because the application sections are written in a way that anybody can understand. And the idea is that you should know the applications of what you're learning in chemistry. So go ahead and uh, read that. Spread, you know, use today and tomorrow to finish chapter 15, reading through it, write the examples. Only four examples, 15.1, 15.2, example 15.7, and example 15.8. So do those examples, and then you'll be in good shape for our quiz on Monday. We'll discuss more of these on Thursday again, and then on Monday we'll go from there. Thermal chemistry is a branch of physical chemistry, as I said yesterday. We are also going to see things in kinetics. So after thermochemistry, there's a section on kinetics, and then it goes on to other big, big fields of chemistry that we'll focus on. So only chapter 15 to 19 left for our chemistry course. Um, there are some topics that you should master and know well, no matter what you do beyond chemistry. And one of them is molar mass. You're going to see that over and over again. 
please email me if you have questions. This is very important so that I know what to focus on on Thursday. Um, those who are studying Clef College Chemistry, uh, uh, or Clef Chemistry, you would notice that the on page five, it gives you a breakdown. Notice that you have structure of matter, states of matter, and so on. But there's a section, 5%, which goes to thermodynamics. And thermodynamics here, um, it gives you a focus, uh, things to focus on uh, with thermodynamics. It talks about state functions. It goes into enthalpy. The first law of thermodynamics is, uh, another name for it is called the conservation of energy. So the first law of thermodynamics specifically states that the change in internal energy is equal to the difference between the energy supplied to the system as heat and the energy removed from the system as work uh, performed on the surroundings. The energy that the first law states that the change in internal energy is equal to the difference between the energy supplied to the system as heat and the energy removed from the system as work. Um, there's a formula that is given for the first law of thermodynamics, which is delta E is equal to Q minus W. Delta E is equal to Q minus W, where W is equal to negative P delta V. What do each of these things represent? Uh, delta E is equal to the change in total energy or internal energy of the system. So this is the change in uh, total energy or internal energy. So that's change, right, in energy. Um, Q is the heat added, heat added to the system. W is the work done by the system on the surroundings. Work done on the system by this on the work done by the system on the surroundings. P is the pressure, and delta V is the change in volume of the system. So basically, um, when you're doing the first law of thermodynamics, you have the formulas that you need. Uh, and now you have uh, the va what do each of those uh, things, wh what do they represent in the formula, right? And then if I gave you values for these things, can you plug them into the formula? That's what you're doing with the first law of th thermodynamics. Uh, enthalpy is a state function. That's a key thing to know about enthalpy. Enthalpy is a state function. What is a state function? You go back. And the state function is defined by conditions, or the state of a system is defined by the conditions of pressure, temperature, and number of moles of a substance. State functions depend only on initial and final states of a system. State functions depend only on the initial and final states of a system. So thermodynamics deals with initial and final states. State functions are not dependent on how one gets from the initial state to the final state. The mechanism from getting from one state to another is represented by the kinetics of a reaction. So if I'm only concerned about the beginning and the end, right, that's a focus of state functions, right? If you're going on a mountain, um, the mountain is over here, which I wouldn't, I'm not interested in mountain climbing, but let's say you want to climb a mountain, you're trying to climb the mountain, state functions are more concerned about, again, the initial and the final. There's another branch that focuses on the steps in between. Thermodynamics in this class, in this section, is focused on things like this, the initial and the final state of a function. That's what we see with thermodynamics. Um, okay, moving on, let's see. Entropy. Entropy is the measure, growing up we used to call it, we just said it was a measure of disorderliness of a system. Right, entropy. If there's high entropy, so like someone's room is disordered, right, then we'll say there's a high entropy. But if there's things in order, then there's low entropy. Now notice, generally speaking, things move into a state of disorderliness. It takes energy to make things orderly, right? So that's very important. Entropy deals with the state of disorderliness of a system. Now, the second law of thermodynamics deals with entropy. So please remember that. Um, second law of thermodynamics deals with entropy. So entropy is the measure of disorder and its units are joules per Kelvin. Um, entropy is a state function as well, just like enthalpy. Um, the change in entropy of a reaction is the difference between the entropy contained in the product and the entropy contained in the reactants. So entropy is a state function. Um, now, the second law of thermodynamics simply states that the entropy of the universe increases during a spontaneous reaction. The entropy of the universe 
increases during a spontaneous reaction. The change in entropy of the system is defined as delta S. That's what we did. We, we do delta S for that change in entropy. Okay, so those are some key things. Let me give you one more thing here. So we've talked a little bit about enthalpy. We've talked a little bit about calorimetry, which your book discusses. Um, in, uh, in your PowerPoint slides, they give you uh, calorimetry discussed there as an insulated container similar to a thermos in which a thermometer detects the temperature change um, that occurs during a chemical reaction. That's what a calorimeter does. Um, another key definition, enthalpy is the thermal energy content of a system at constant pressure. Enthalpy is the thermal energy content, right? Thermal, when you think of thermal, you begin to think of heat and temperature. Um, so enthalpy is the thermal energy change, um, is the thermal energy content of a system at constant pressure. So in the list of things here, we've talked a little bit about enthalpy, we've talked about calorimetry, we've talked about, uh, in finding uh, the fusion, right, I, I use the word uh, vaporization and fusion. There's these values that are given in your book. We don't expect you to memorize all the values of, of, of fusion and, and, and vaporization. These are values that are given to you, and you just need to know how to use them in a formula. We've talked a little bit about entropy. We've talked about the first law of thermodynamics, and then the second law of thermodynamics. So then what's left is things like Hess's law. So let me talk about Hess's law, and we'll begin to descend the plane. This is a shorter video. I'll try and get you more content for tomorrow, but please feel free to use any videos available. Let me see that you know how to use your resources, right? To find videos and definitions for each of these terms that we're going to focus on on our quiz. So basically, Hess's law states that the delta H of a reaction that is composed of multiple steps is equal to the sum of the delta H for each of those steps. So the delta H of a reaction, right? The, the, we call it the enthalpy change of a reaction. So the del or, or the heat of formation, sorry, the heat of formation. Um, so we need to write all these down. So we have delta H. Okay. So the delta H of a reaction is composed of multiple steps. So if the delta H of a reaction is composed of multiple steps, then the sum of each of those steps, right? You, you could take the sum of each of the steps of the delta H. That's part of what Hess's law is talking about. You could take uh, that the delta H of a reaction that is composed of multiple steps is equal to the sum of each of the delta H of the e for, for, for each step. Hess's law is an offshoot of the first law of thermodynamics because energy must be conserved in order for the sum of the energies of a component reaction uh, to equal the energy of the total reaction. So if we take the delta H of one thing, the delta H of another, the delta H of another, that will give us the total delta H then of that particular reaction. So it's just showing that, that, that there's something to be said about each of the individual steps of a reaction. And the energy needs to be conserved. The energy needs to be kept. And that's what the first law of thermodynamics said. Like, you might have heard people talk about the law of, uh, the first law of thermodynamics by saying that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. Things like that. I don't know if you've heard it in that way, but that's part of the idea of this first law of thermodynamics. And Hess's law is um, continuing that discussion. There is delta H with a sub F, and that is the change of enthalpy for reaction that forms a compound from its pure, from its pure elements under standard conditions. That is the standard heat of formation. Um, so the standard heat of formation can be used uh, to estimate delta H of any reaction. So basically the delta H is equal to the delta H uh, standard heat of formation of the products minus the delta H F of the reactants. I'm sorry, I'm running out of room there. But basically, that's the relationship between the delta H and the delta H sub F. There are different values for delta H sub F. And again, we don't expect you to memorize all of them. But if we gave you a table with delta H sub F, can you find the values for what you need? That's what matters. So for example, if someone said that the delta H sub F of um, uh, a lead, right? Let's say lead is reacting with something and it gives us a certain value. And someone says, what is the delta H? What you would need to do is you would take the delta H sub F of the product. So let's say the delta H sub F of the product is um, uh, negative 220, okay? So let's say that's the delta H sub F, negative 220. And then we know, so this is the delta H sub F of the product minus, we basically need the delta H sub F of the reactants as well. 
And so we'll take the delta H sub F of the product. So let's say it's this and something else. Whatever the products are, you just add their delta H's together. And then you take the reactants and you add their delta H sub F together. And you do this minus that. Now, I'll make another video where I go into the calculations. But right now, as I said, write the definitions. Write the, so write the definitions down. Write the formulas. Write the examples. And then look at those definitions or videos of those concepts if you need to. Maybe you read the chapter and you're comfortable. That's fine. And then focus your time now on finding the delta, uh, like, like focus your time now on just preparing for Thursday, getting those ready. On Thursday, let's do some calculations in class. I think that'll be a good use of our time. So let's plan to do calculations in class together on Thursday. Right now, just do those things that I've discussed briefly. Okay, sorry, this was a longer video, but I will talk to you more later. Please email me if you have any questions. Just get your notes ready and we'll have a blast on Thursday. Uh, 30 minutes of calculations in chemistry. Have a blessed day.